Hello students and welcome back to the Lore of the Iron Kingdoms with me, Professor Castor. And today we start our second semester and we are going to be going over the Protectorate of Meneth. And for anybody unaware of who Meneth is and who the Protectorate is, well, it's pretty much one in the same. Meneth is their god, also known as the Mast God. If you want to go into heretical knowledge, uh, Meneth was actually created by Dunia, the god of the Trolken and the Ogren. And I think the gobbers as well. And he was created to hunt the beast of all shapes that were eating Dunia's followers. And I suppose at some point in time, he created man, which, you know, that would make him the god of man, which uh, he likes to, well, say that very often. And if you watch back to my Grimkin episode, we can go over a lot of Minot's early days and people that did not want to follow him and shunned his gifts, and we all see what happened with the Grimkin. But we are not going to be discussing them in a heretical sense. We are going to be discussing them from their own history, all the military and all their stuff. So, But before we begin, thank you guys so much for coming to class. Thank you guys so much for liking, subscribing, commenting. It always helps the channel grow and keep this steam train rolling. And thank you, a Privateer Press, for letting us read your fantastic lore. So let's begin. Oh, and a side word, we're actually going to be reading over the old archives, and then we'll be transitioning to the newer archives towards the end of this, um, just because the older archives actually have a lot more lore and a lot more setup, and uh, I might skip over some of the new lore that we've just read, so if it matches up or if it's the same thing, I'll try to avoid it so we don't repeat ourselves. But with that out of the way, let's begin with the military of the Protectorate of Meneth. Faith, fervor, and devotion. No other nation in Western Amorn has made such great advances from such humble beginnings as the Protectorate of Meneth. The Protectorate has risen from the defeated and oppressive Signarn minority to one of the great powers of the continent, stretching to reach it of its military far beyond its original borders. While the Menite religion itself is rooted in antiquity, with ancient ceremonies and prayers taken from the earliest written words, the rise of the nation as a respected military power has occurred only within the last several decades. The Protectorate has been extremely successful in expanding and revolutionizing its military while staying true to its religious convictions. This transformation was made possible by the bold examples of several great leaders, some of who have passed into the afterlife in Urcane, and others who yet walk among the faithful, providing direct guidance. In success are all the more remarkable given that the Protectorate has the smallest population of all the Iron Kingdoms. Proof of the triumph of its efforts can be seen in accomplishments like the successful defense of Seoul, the unprecedented invasion of Caspia, Caspia, and the seizure of Lely's city of Laren. By the strength of its army, the Protectorate of Meneth has taken control of its destiny, reshaped itself, and demonstrated its ability to fulfill its promise to strike down all who refuse to bow to the creator of man. And we have a little side note here, Urcane and the War of Souls. As a deeply religious people, the citizens of the Protectorate of Meneth worry as much about the afterlife as they do the day-to-day -day lives. Menites believe reality is divided between Cain the world of the living in Urcane, the world of the dead. While the creator once walked on Cain, he now exists solely in Urcane, where he oversees his vast domain within which dwell souls of every faithful Menite who has lived and died since mankind was created. This is the city of man. By its nature, Urcane is imperfectly understood by the living. It is impossible for mortals to grasp the true scope and nature. Menites are taught that outside the great walls, enclosing the city of man, lies the infinite hellish wilderness of untamed chaos, supernatural storms, and savage monstrous beasts. This is the domain of Minot's ancient foe, the Devourer Worm. Other lesser gods, such as Maro and Thamar, have their own poor domains in Urcane, where their residents are envious of the shelter afforded to those who dwell in the city of man. War wages between the followers of these gods in Urcane. This is the War of Souls, an epic and unending clashing between the divine powers and the afterlife. Menites believe it is their destiny to live an eternity in service of Meneth in the city of man after they die. Each of the faithful must play his part to preserve Meneth's realm from the depravities of the devourer and the temptations set forth by the perfidious philosophies of Maro and Thamar. Yeah, he wasn't super fond of him when they reached godhood with him. That is neither here nor there, and we're going to move on before I get heretical again. The nation has been preparing to unleash its crusades for decades. 
and the hour is at hand. Its military has been built into a tower of strength through the work of past hierarchs, and now at its pinnacle is a man who embodies the principles of faith, Hierarch Severus, the first warcaster to rise initially to absolute control of the military and then to absolute authority over the entire nation. This leader has spent his entire life working to see the Menite Crusade realized. His people stand united behind him, willing to execute any order at his command and strike down whatever enemy becomes the subject of his wrath. The military, to undergo radical reorganization and expansion, already the Protectorate Armed Forces show a blend of old and new ideas, pragmatic discipline mixed with religious ceremony. This is the nature of the Protectorate itself, which exists not for temporal power alone, but also the protection of the Creator's interest on Cain. The Protectorate is a theocracy on every level, which its priests assuming positions of rulership over daily governance as well as military doctrines. Although the ma majority of its standing army is made up of citizen soldiers compelled to serve, the Protectorate's elite forces draw from several ancient martial orders, each tightly integrated into the Temple of Meneth and its clergy. Its diversity and complexity of the ancient and modern influence makes the Protectorate military difficult for the enemies to predict, a fact Protectorate leaders are adept at exploiting. While many of its military decisions prioritize mundane principles of logistics and long-term strategic interests, the Protectorate is just as likely to exert its strength for majority religious goals. Some of the objectives are comprehensible only to prophets and others who interpret divine potence. The faithful of Cain are part of the endless war of souls, and the gods fight in ur -Cain, even if they do not always understand their place or function. Via intermediaries such as the Harbinger of Meneth or members of the Reclaim Reclament Order, Protectorate leaders have unique perspectives on divine will. And then when you're watching the YouTube channel, I will have a military of Protectorate and their breakdown of how it works. And of course, at the very top of that, we have Meneth, of course, because, you know, it's a religious order. And then Hierarch Severus, um, the Harbinger and the Reclament Order follows right after Meneth. And then... Hierarch Severus runs the Temple of Meneth and everything below it. Uh, but you guys can look at it on the YouTube channel and uh, check it out if you really want very specific numbers and names to each of these sections. Um, yeah, but yeah, check it out. And uh, yeah, you can pause it right here if you want to read it. But let's continue. For this reason, soldiers of the Protectorate have learned to trust the priesthood implicitly. Those at the bottom of the chain of command are accustomed to fighting in ignorance of the ultimate purpose of their actions. Orders are not to be questioned but obeyed, accepted with the same faith that assures each Menite of its place waiting for him in the afterlife. Although not every Menite is equally pious, in the aggregate their beliefs bestow a degree of conviction, efficiency, and zealous fanaticism that strengthens them through the most difficult ordeals and setbacks. Enemies of the faith fear this zealotry, other, as other armies must rely on less certain traits like loyalty and duty, sometimes bought by coin. The Protectorate military has proven that faith is, has tangible power. There is no army in Western Amorn as singularly united. And that is true, because uh, yeah, once, uh, once loyalty breaks down or things start happening in the battlefield, like Protectorate always kind of hold on to each other, although zealotry can only get you so far when you're in the midst of combat. Uh, but we have a little side note here. Menite, Menite priest hierarchy. While the Protectorate of Meneth is a new nation, the ranks adopted by its priests are from ancient traditions that have been only slightly reinterpreted to suit the needs of the theocracy. The ranks used by sole Menite clergy are also shared by Menites elsewhere in the Iron Kingdoms, such as among the Old Faith in Kodor. From the lowest to the highest, the priestly ranks are Fledge, also sometimes termed as Initiate, Priest, Potentate, Sovereign, Viscos, and Hierarch. These ranks predate the Signarn Civil War, but historically very few Hierarchs have existed outside of the Protectorate of Mina. This title has special religious significance and symbolism to the Menite faith, representing absolute theology, theological authority. Traditionally, the rank is bestowed only upon the priest who has a unanimous support of the Viscos, a conjunction that almost never happens. For example, the Old Faith in Kodor has not titled anyone with Hierarch since before the invasion of the Orgoth, and for this reason, clergy is led by a myriad of Viscos. 
The Protectorate was born from the Civil War, inspired by the first Sol Menite to call himself Hierarch in centuries. Hierarch Solon, he united all the southern Viscos under his leadership and gathered the scattered faithful in Caspia. This set the precedent for those who would follow. Viscos Ozil, who reluctantly assumed governance of the Protectorate after Solon's death, set down the terms by which the nation would be run. By these laws, the leadership of the Protectorate rested in the hands of the Synod of Viscas. Each Viscas has jurisdiction over a major aspect of the government. The law stipulated that the Synod would choose to surrender its authority to a singular senior priest who earned their unanimous support, who would thenceforth be called the Hierarch. Once approved, the Hierarch would retain the title for life, and no mortal power could revoke his authority. In this regard, Hierarch is not an inherited position, nor can it be passed to a chosen heir. Severus is the sixth Hierarch of the Protectorate history, and the first to transition seamlessly to the head of the temple, an event made possible by the guidance of the Harbinger of Meneth. In becoming Hierarch, Severus joined the esteemed company of his legendary predecessor, Hierarch Garrick Voyle, Kilgore Ravenol, Kaltor Turgis, Gervalt Lucktine, and Sullen. In the Protectorate, an acknowledged hierarch becomes the ultimate voice of both secular and spiritual authority. Each hierarch relies upon the Synod of Viscas to oversee the government bureaucracy, which is run on every level by a subordinate priests. Viscas maintain the peace, regulate theology doctrine, theological doctrine, and ensure the smooth running of the Protectorate's industries, the health of its population, and the adequate support of any garrison or crusade. If required, Viscos join the crusade as military leaders, but often they are accompanied, super, they are occupied supervising the nation's infrastructure. A number of active Viscos can change as required. The nine current Viscos are listed below. We have Robin Viscos, an overseer of Seoul, vice scrutator. Then we have Bondolin, a first Viscos of Emmer, vice scrutator, prime curate of the secretary initiation. Then we have Vesher, second Viscos of Emmer, vice scrutator head of the Lucium of the True Law. And we have Nestor, third Viscas of Ember, senior scrutator, overseer of the vassals of Meneth. Then we have Elman, fourth Viscas of Ember, senior scrutator, overseer of the Temple of Defense and Armament. Then we have Sollers, a Viscas and overseer of the Tower of Judgment, a senior scrutator. Then we have Razik, fifth Viscas of Ember, overseer of Soul Midnight Artificers. Then we have Jarsrun, 6th Viscos of Emmer, Overseer of the Mines, Quarries, and Minutes Fury, uh, which is a flame that they like to use and throw on people. It's a very, very effective flame, if you will. Then we have Skerl, Viscos of the South, Overseer of Ancient Ichthyr, the Martial Orders, and the Militia. The staggeringly high percentage of the Protectorate's population serves at least part-time in its military, considerably higher than it is the case of any of its rivals. The temple has been deploying and stockpiling weapons since the foundation, and it's able to arm and equip a full third of its population. Training takes time, and the Sol Menites have discovered that not every citizen is equally zealous, qualified, or capable of assisting the war effort. Leaders of the temple are constantly evaluating the time required to train a professional soldier against the immediate need to field armed bodies. All of the Protectorate enemies have greater population, resources, and manufacturing capacities, a fact that which Synod is well aware. Despite the large number of armed civilians bolstering the Protectorate's war effort, at its core the military is most reliant on the strength of its smaller and highly trained martial orders. The backbone of the Protectorate military is its elite knight exemplars, and increasingly the ranks of the Temple Flame Guard. Members of these two orders are cognitive of the fact that exists solely to fight the battles of their faith. The leader of the Exemplar Order is particularly have to serve as a preeminent military leaders and advisors since the founding of the Protectorate. The Temple Flame Guard has assumed the role of its regular army of the Protectorate of Meneth. At one time charged with the defense of Menite temples and holy sites, the Flame Guard have been newly expanded to execute Protectorate's military ambitions. The evolution of the Knights Exemplar has been more circuitous. These knights have predated the Order of the Wall, an ancient order of independent Menite knights, but the paladins of the Order Wall refuse to serve blindly and believe that dictates of faith must be adjudicated by one's conscience. Their beliefs irregularly put them at odds with the priest caste, 
the exemplar order was created as a code of absolute obedience to the clergy in reaction to this and eventually eclipsed the order of the wall, particularly in the protectorate of Minas. The Scrutators came to rely on the Knight Exemplar to help them maintain a doctrinal purity among the people and root out potential heretics and traitors. While the Order of the Wall still exists in small numbers, its impact on the Protectorate politics and military is negligible and preserved out of sense of tradition and because these paladins are popular figures with the populace. But there is no question the Knight Exemplars has risen to become the preeminent warriors of the Temple. Yeah, I think the the paladins of the Order of the Wall are usually actually really good people because unlike some of the religious fanatics, uh, the Order of the Wall actually cares about the populace, actually cares about, you know, saving human lives rather than, you know, telling people to go die without cause. Yeah, but back to the reading. While the Knights Exemplar still serve as the martial arm of faith, over time it has become less occupied with keeping the vigil on the faithful than battling external enemies. The role of the internal police force was shifted initially to the Temple Flame Guards and then later on to the Order of the Fist. That order was created specifically for this task. Its monks trained to blend in with civilian populations and root out treachery from within. Working in tandem with the Order of the Fist, the Flame Guard cleansers and Daughters of the Flame watch the citizenry and address both internal and external threats. The Knight's Exemplar has evolved into a purely martial force, regularly sent to battle in foreign lands. While the Exemplar Knights are the Protectorate's preeminent fighting force, their code and training limits their number. Not every pious man or woman who would serve the Temple is suited to swearing the oath of the Exemplar. Similarly, the Temple Flame Guard requires full-time dedication during at least the year of service for the professional soldiery. A large number of Protectorate citizens are allowed to aid the war effort without dedicating their lives to this task by joining its mil militia forces or volunteering when the battle priest sounds the call of war. Caches of arms are maintained throughout Protectorate to arm and equip these forces at a moment's low notice. While referring to it as voluntary service, in time of crusade as compulsory, the clergy has issued quotas for able-bodied men and women required to fill the ranks of the auxiliary fighting forces. The initiates of the Order of the Fist have proven adept at rounding up and enlisting those who would not demonstrate the devotion or piety expected of citizens of Protectorate. Nonetheless, the continual immersion of the population in religious doctrine makes it relatively easy to gather large numbers of willing zealots and soldiers of all ages into service. These lay soldier forces make up the lesser military orders, such as the Deliverers. It looks like we have a little side note here. Control of the seas. The Protectorate of Minas is not a naval power, although it does possess a small number of armed fighting vessels to employ to defend its docks in Seoul and the coastline extending between Seoul and the ancient Ichthyr. The majority of Protectorate ocean-faring vessels are working ships, including fishing, fleet-based, and Seoul. Any of these ships could be rigged for battle if required, but the theocracy has largely surrendered control over the Gulf of Signar to the Signar Navy. The Viscos are aware they would lose any substantial engagement against Signar's formidable eastern fleet. While this is seen as a weakness to the Protectorate's defense, it is not proven to be important enough to address. Most of the military clashes between the Protectorate and its enemies take place on land, and there have been no substantial attempts by the Signar Navy to strike at a smaller settlement dotting the Protectorate's coastline. Crixian vessels occasionally make strikes against Protectorate shores, but these incidences are rare. It is proven to be more cost-effective to allow Signar's Navy to intercept Crixian raiders rather than expanding limited resources toward shipbuilding. Seoul's docks are well defended and sheltered behind imposing walls, while the capital of Emmer and its vital industries and mines are safely a hundred miles inland. The most vulnerable protectorate targets in this regard is a blessed city of the ancient Ichthyr, whose isolated location has thus far served to preserve it from attacks. There has been an ongoing struggle between the respect for the tradition of each martial order and the establishment of a clear and centralized chain of command. Traditionally, as long as its leaders of each order demonstrated their loyalty to the priest caste, it is particularly to Synod or Hierarch, there have been given complete autonomy over their organizations. Some of this remains 
as each order can function as a self-contained organization. However, Hyrak Voil realized the ability to conduct war at a larger scale would require the integration of the desperate elements of the Protectorate's fighting forces. It was this task in mind that Severus was first promoted to Grand Scrutator and charged with the unification of the military orders. Grand Scrutator Severus understood that reorganizing the Protectorate's military structure to support its crusade required careful attention to logistics and planning and create the office of war counselor. He appointed Bron Skizen to this post as a senior, most secular officer in the Protectorate's military, not only to oversee the militias, but also to work with the various martial orders to maintain a smooth running of the crusades. While war counselor Skizen has no field authority, all elements of protectorate militaries are expected to cooperate with the staff in regards to supply, logistics, and personal shifts. His office has none of the glory of those who march to battle, but without his efforts, the protectorate could not support the larger endeavors. The war counselor staff has moved from Emmer to Laren to serve alongside Hyrax Severus, although couriers regularly convey coded messages back to the six Viscos of Emmer to coordinate with the capital. An army forged in secrets. Founded in the aftermath of the civil conflict, the Protectorate of Minath has always had a tumultuous relationship with Signar, the nation that forced its submission at its founding by the terms agree upon the end of the Signaran civil war in 484 AR. The Protectorate was forbidden to keep a standing army. These laws were never strictly enforced, but for decades the Protectorate seemed to accept them, even while creating and expanding martial orders to protect the temple and its adherents. The need of these groups was justified by ongoing fighting with tribal Indrians southeast of Signar, which continued even after the majority were pacified or converted to worship Minath in 504 AR. For many decades, Signar seemed content with this arrangement, perhaps reassured that the Minites had inherited a resource-poor region and one inhabited by numerous hostile tribesmen. Laws were enacted allowing the Protectorate to arm and train defenders of its temples and other holy places as well to ensure the basic safety of its citizenry. The martial orders created under this pretext persist today each of which remain tightly integrated to the temple itself. We have a little side note here. Scrutators of Minath. Scrutators are the essential part of the Protectorate of Minath's theocracy, forming the inner circle of the highest leadership among the priest caste. Their internal orders is removed from the ordinary bureaucratic and liturgical concerns occupying the ordinary priesthood. While all priests are to be respected and obeyed by laymen, it is the scrutators who watch over the priests themselves. They are considered the dark protectors of the faith, those who feel the difficult but vital calling to put all other considerations aside and focus on the preservation of the temple by any means necessary. Being a scrutator is not a privilege but a responsibility, and one not bestowed lightly. The scrutators consider their position uninviable. They cannot spend their time in the serene contemplations of the divine like ordinary priests. Instead, they must train to master the pragmatic arts of governance, torture, and interrogation. It is their purpose to test the faithful continually for any hints of treachery or heresy. Captured enemies must similarly be questioned for vital intelligence, punished for their transgression, and executed. Scrutators believe that inflicting pain is the ultimate course to root out deception and discover truth. This caste must abandon the indulgences of mercy and forgiveness, a fact symbolized by their masks they wear. These masks serve as a barrier between their human face and and the individuals they confront and interrogate. While all Minite priests wear ceremonial masks in honor of the ones worn by Minath, ordinary priests can remove them when speaking with friends or family. Scrutators are unmasked only when alone, as their station denies them in the comforts of family or friendship. Among Minite citizenry, a regular priest may be loved and adored as a teacher of Minath's glory, but scrutators are universally feared. The Scrutators have achieved a prominence within Protectorate society that far exceeds their traditional status. Some ancient times, it has been rare to see more than a single Scrutator who served by exacting judgment on captured criminals and heretics. They were executioners and torturers, and it was their task to root out those who had broken the law, whether temporal or divine. Shortly after founding the Protectorate of Minath, the Scrutator cast seized the reins of power. They became leading priests and the internal watchmen of the clergy. 
It is natural that these formidable figures would rise to the position of authority. Every hierarch since the Protectorate's founding has served as a Scrutator, and Synod believes only Scrutators have the proper training and experience to make the difficult choices required to lead the nation and preserve the faith against the faithless. And these guys are super scary looking I, because they wear the mask. They can't take them off. They're pretty much drilled on their face unless they're alone. I guess that, you know, they take it off in their own time. But like, yeah, these guys, these guys really don't talk much either because it's kind of hard to hear what they talk about because well, those masks are kind of muffled usually. I imagine they're usually praying, but uh, yeah, these guys are a dark, dark figures in the Meaneth army, and I've gone up against them a handful of times because they do have some warcasters that are scrutators, and uh, yeah, yeah, these guys, I think the only thing they do outside of praying is training, so, but let's continue reading. The adoption of labor jacks and eventual war jacks by the protectorates have early in their reign of the higher Gervald Lucktine but not without considerable dissension. The hardline traditionalists insist the innovation of the Mechanica were an athema of Meaneth according to the true law because of the arcane science required in their construction. Hyrak Lucktine and his Aviscos foresaw that such machines would be vital in long-term prosperity and success of the nude nation and argued it was their holy duty to find a way to purify their creations and use. The visionaries granted the Mechanica and the Arcane Arts an unquestionable tainted, but conjectured that they would be sanctified and blessed by the proper application of prayer. The engraving of Holy Scripture and the constant ministration of clergy tasked with cleansing them. By Minot's grace would his people claim the might of the contrivances for him. While labor jacks have incorporated into a number of industries to exploit the reliable strength and stamina of these machines. Many more were outfitted with improvised weapons to fight alongside the Protectorate's martial orders. Marching alongside these jacks were the first choirs, singing holy hymns to bless and sanctify the machines in battle. It is doubtful Signar's government, authority, and spies were entirely fooled by pretenses that the Protectorate's jacks were committed to labor. However, they turned a blind eye to the mustering of temple soldiers and the arming of labor jacks, so long as they were employed against savages dwelling in the fringes of the wastes. It is also likely these efforts obscured precisely how many of the jacks had been converted to battle readiness, in addition to disguising the fact that Menites were building new war jacks of their own design. Aiding in the clandestine efforts of the early protectorates was Signar's almost exclusive focus on the great city of Sol, once eastern Caspia. The protectorates lacked any meaningful secondary city for many decades, so this was understandable oversight. As a result, however, the Signaran crown was blind to several significant developments many miles from the Black River. In 504 AR, a great earthquake struck the sands in the midst of a large battle between the Solmenites and a vast host of Idrian warriors. In the wake of the earthquake, which led the Menites standing but forced every Idrian to their knees, most of the Idrians present immediately converted to the worship of the Creator. This act of divine providence was not only greatly increased and diversified the Protectorate's population, but also brought the Idrian city of Immer and its surrounding into the theocracy. Emmer remained a primitive city for many decades, but several untapped mineral resources were discovered nearby shortly after the conversion of its populace. These included several rich veins of iron, copper, and tin in the foothills east and southeast of Emmer. While it is, took many years to build the mines and infrastructure to exploit these resources, they proved to be vital to the nascent protectorate industry particularly the eventual production of weapons and warjack components. Because most of the raw ore and other resources were initially processed in Seoul, Signar never fully apprehended the extent of these mining operations and thus vastly underestimated the extent of the Protectorate's war industries until their fruits were revealed at the outset of the Crusades. More resources awaited discovering in the barren east discovered by Hyar Kaltor Turgis, who considerably broadened the Protectorate's borders during the reign from 535 to 549 AR. This period saw the construction of Tower of Judgment and the northern border to stand as a looming bastion of the faith, a stronghold of the Scrutators. 
in the south, ancient Ichthyr was rediscovered and settled once again, bringing the wealth of forgotten sacred texts, but also more tangible gains of precious stones. The diamonds and other gems gathered there helped open trade abroad and lining the pockets of Signarn inspectors and border guards. As important as these findings were, it was discovering and exploiting Minot's fury, distilled from less volatile oil bubbling up from the sands, that would rank among the greatest achievements of High Arcturgus's reign. This is the proper, with proper distillation and refinery process, the oil became far more than a fuel for lanterns and cooking fires. It is a substance able to spark tremendous conflagration as it most refined mean its fury ignites immediately on exposure to air, adherence to services with tenacity, and burns extremely high temperatures that can melt steel. In time, it became one of the signature weapons of the Protectorate, a substance synonymous with the wrath of the lawgiver. Yeah, and that stuff doesn't come off too, so yeah, if you're... If you're ever ignited by that, you're kind of you're kind of done. So I would be very wary when you start seeing these guys start throwing their flamethrowers around. And we got a little side panel here: the Umber Guard, Flame Guards of the Tenth Interdiction, it appears to be a full army list of their leadership. Uh, the Preceptor Marvus, Temple Flame Guard, Senior Arms Master, and all sorts of assets they got: 900 Temple Flame Guards, 200 Flame Guard Cleansers, 90 Daughters of the Flame four heavy war jacks, including one guardian, and then six light jacks. The Fiat Flamma, let there be flame. The Umber Guard earned its fame during the defense of Sol in the attack of Caspia, proving to be as resolute example of the rest of the Flame Guard could look to for inspiration. Fiora has selected the Umber Guard to serve as the core of the dedicated interdiction under her personal supervision, tasked to undermine Signaran defenses in the Southern Theater. Those who serve the Umber Guard do not know these actions have not been technically authorized by Hierarch Sephiris, and our loyalty tests with Fiora, nor would they care. The hardened zealots, who have been thoroughly integrated into the modern structure of the Flame Guard, they understand the priests are the rulers of the theocracy, but they obey only their chain of command. By their training, the command reaches no further than the priestess and the protector of her flame. During the initial invasion of Sol by the Signarns, the Umber Guard, both were among the most zealous defenders of the great temple of the Creator and protected Solon's remnants, the tomb of the revered leader. This interdiction earned honor and prestige during the defense battles and fought in the bloodiest and most protected of the subsequent street-to-street -street battles. They learned very well the nature of the enemy and how to best thwart their advance through the city. The interdiction is most famous, however, for its vital role in the subsequent counterattack on Caspia. The Umber Guard was at the forefront of the Minites chasing the Signarans out of Seoul, and it was these soldiers who took the initiative to seize the Signaran gates before they could be closed. The subsequent invasion of Caspia would not have been possible without these heroic efforts, which earned these soldiers a personal commendation of both Fiora and the Grand Exemplar Krios. The Umber Guard is now stationed in Western Seoul, posted at the Solon's Fortress. They help protect the historical monument during the costly and delicate restoration from the lengthy defamation it endured when captured by Signarans and used as their field headquarters in the city. While some phalanxes of the interdiction are found at this site at all times, the majority are frequently sent on special missions, including into the outlying regions north of Seoul and sometimes clandestinely across the Black River and into enemy territory. They have been used to gauge the ongoing defenses situation within the Signarn as well as intercept military supplies and conduct other harassment operations, such as burning crops and food warehouses. Their goal is to weaken the Signarn defenders at the Caspian Garrison and East Wall without provoking a substantial counterattack. Many flame guard phalanxes are made up of a singular unit type but the phalanxes of the 10th interdiction are mixed. This allows them to adapt to evolving needs better and to operate semi-autonomously. The bulk of the forces remain Temple Flame Guard, but it also includes a large attachment of cleansers, as well as hand-picked contingent of the most experienced Daughters of the Flame, who are most often chosen to conduct the most challenging espionage and sabotage missions. Zealous and the Flame Lovers, and that is the Umber Guard. But let's continue our reading. Igniting the Great Crusades 
The Protectorate focused on expansion of its territories and the construction of infrastructure in the harsh south and east until the rise of Hierarch Vigor Ravenal in 568 AR. Ravenal, the fourth Protectorate Hierarch, was the first to preach the doctrine of true independence. Under his direction, the clergy began to gather their nation's strength with the goal of restoring the word of Meneth to those kingdoms that had forsaken him. Ravenel preached it. It was not enough of the Protectorate to reserve the true law. The heretics abroad must be cowed into submission just as the Adrians had been. He asserted that the Morrowind's nation was a cesspool of providity, lawlessness, and faithlessness, and that their forcibly conversion would be mercy compared to the fate awaiting them in the afterlife. Ravenel stockpiled resources and weapons purchased in the sale of diamonds abroad. He also ordered the expansion of the Knights Exemplar and the Temple Flame Guard, while ostensibly still heeding the treaties of Signar, as the groups of the Temple were the Temple's protectors, and therefore enabled the Protectorate to circumvent Signarin's prescriptions against building a standing army. These two orders would become the cornerstone of the Protectorate's new military. Ravenel also endorsed the creation of the Order of the Fist, an internal police force founded and led by the man who would succeed him, Garrick Voyle. The founding of the Order of the Fist freed the Knights Exemplar from their civil responsibilities, allowing them to focus solely on the preparation for the Im imminent and necessary battles to come. Following Ravenel's death, years of infighting among the Synod left the government ineffective until Hierarch Voyle's eventual rise to power in 588 AR. Voyle consolidated the power and aided of his devoted monks, his Scrutator allies, and his own formidable abilities. He was strongly influenced by his predecessor and became the work of Ravenel had begun, and continued the work that Ravenel had begun. Voyle's reign began immediately following the scarred invasion that had occupied Signar for four years. This war had tremendously taxed the Signaran army and navy and required them to spend time rebuilding and recruiting distractions Voyle capitalized on as he began to expand the Protectorate's military strength substantially. He was later similarly able to exploit the era of Signaran confusion and unrest following Leto Rathorn's coup. Rathorn's. Leto Rathorn's coup. Um, in Signar, Leto actually... Uh, actually took power from his brother who was going insane and killing lots of people. Yeah, his brother became almost a dictator in Signar. So Leto, his younger brother, had to step in to uh, oust him. And that's a whole it's a whole different thing. We're going to be going over that later. As Ravenel had before him, Voyle understood that before the Protectorate could launch his crusades, it must first lay a proper foundation for its armies. Key to this was his radical decision to move the capital of the Protectorate to Emmer, which was entirely reconstructed under his direction, into a modern city with full industrial capabilities. This placed the central industries of the Protectorate far farther from Signar and interference, as well as closer to the vital mines of the Eastern Hills. Work with the capital allowed Hierarch Voyle to implement several other reforms to strengthen the Protectorate's military, including creating the House of Truth as the headquarters for the new vassals of Meneth. This organization had seen had seed in early eff efforts to capture foreign arcanists and force them to provide warjack cortexes for the Protectorate's army. This practice had proven its worth, but Voyle greatly expanded its operation and included efforts to recruit and train both arcanists and mechanics from among the Menites faithful. The captured wizards brought with them the valuable lore and techniques from the mechanically advanced nations but the supply of these enslaved and reluctant workers was inadequate to the needs of the Protectorate Warjack industry. Even locally trained members of the vassals were to be watched and scrutinized as closely as those captured abroad, working with arcane energies still considered a corruptive influence requiring precautions. These measures reassured the more traditional and less pragmatic members of the clergy that such a compromise would not violate the spirit of the true law while providing substantial military gains. Once the Protectorate war industry was proceeding at pace, Hierarch Voyle began systematically to test King Leto's willingness to enforce the old treaties. He encouraged certain outlying Menite forces to conduct surgical strikes against Signaran targets, such as shipping along the Black River. These increasingly belligerent displays of Protectorate's growing martial strength were carefully calculated to gauge the Signaran response. 
Simultaneously, Voyle sent ambassadors to Caspia to convey the impression that the peaceful resolution to the skirmishes would be considered. In all cases, the Signarn did not escalate the fight, but instead relied upon diplomatic methods to convey their displeasure. These interactions convinced Voyle the weak-willed Signarn king had strong preferences for peace at all costs and would never have the stomach for casualties required to disarm the protectorates by force. Accordingly, Voyle increased warjack production, weapon stockpiles, and aggressive recruitment and training of battle-readied soldiers for the imminent crusade. The perfect opportunity to unleash the crusade presented itself after Kodor invaded Lael, forcing King Leto's army to dispatch a substantial fighting force north in defense of the beleaguered Signarn ally. Seizing the moment Hyrak Voyle put aside all pretenses of obeying Signarn law to declare the independence of his nation, proclaiming that the Protectorate of Meneth would be beholden only to the true law. The appearance of the Harbinger provided tangible proof Meneth approved of his plan. The Protectorate boldly struck at Signarn while the older nation's military was strained by the war abroad. These initial attacks included the demolition of the March Bridge to disrupt a vital rail line and assaulting Caspia's gates with a great siege engine, Lawbringer, launching the Northern Crusade. In 606 AR, while much of the Protectorate's military might was occupied with clashes against Signar in the south, the Harbinger of Meneth informed Hyark Voyle of the prophetic visions from Meneth regarding the danger in the north. She had received a divine mandate to confront a great darkness that threatened the realm of both living and the afterlife, and she were therefore armed for war. The Hierarch authorized the Northern Crusade and left it in the hands of the Grand Scrutator Severus to ensure the Harbinger reached her destination. In addition, Severus was given several vital long-term objectives, including converting as many outsiders to the faith as possible by any means necessary and creating a permanent bastion for the faithful in the region to be used for the ongoing conversion and arming of the faithful. Among the Northern Crusade's greatest assets was the Harbinger's ability to sway the faithful regardless of their petty national allegiances. In the days leading up to the initiation of the Northern Crusade, the Harbinger called for Menites across Western Amorin to make a pilgrimage to the Protectorate, and many thousands who answered her call greatly bolstered the population of the Menite nation and help begin to bridge theological divisions between the soul Menites of the Protectorate and those who follow, followed to the Menites' true faith of the North. It was hoped that wherever the Northern Crusade marched, the faithful would come to support the Holy Army. Because the Crusade could be cut off from regularly resupply, it was also imperative to establish a fortified stronghold in the North, one that would serve as a permanent conduit south of influx of converted Menites from other nations. The tremendous battle against the dark forces the Harbinger had foreseen did in fact take place in the Thornwood Forest, an ancient Orgoth temple called Gorod, I think that's how you say it. Here massive armies from several nations clashed, clashed each with its own agenda and plans but ultimately maneuvered there through the machinations of the Crixian Lich Lord of Sixius. This maddened undead lord sought to elevate himself to godhood by utilizing the temple's soul-capturing necrotech machinery to siphon all the souls from Meenith's realm in Urcane to fuel his own power. Asphyxius intended to use the Harbinger as a gateway for those souls, drawing on her direct connection with Meenith. Kadorn and Signarn forces were lured to the area to thwart the Crixians, but were largely unaware of the larger cosmological consideration. Because of this ignorance, their efforts only served to interfere with the sacred mission of the Menites. After the intense battles, the Harbinger was able to fulfill her purpose. Although this cost her her life, she sacrificed her existence to end Asphyxius's ambition, and in the process freed the souls of thousands of Menites imprisoned for centuries in the blasphemous Orgoth machinery. This was a miraculous intervention, but the death of the Harbinger was a setback to the Northern Crusade had not anticipated. Grief-stricken, the Testament and High Paladin Darton Vilmon hastened their return of the body of the Harbinger to Emmer, where she was later resurrected 
by Minot's will, channeled through higher Garrick Voile. Meanwhile, Grand Scrutator Severus continued to lead the rest of the Northern Crusade and heroically battled to fulfill its secondary purpose even after being deprived of the Harbinger's blessed presence. The imperative of the stronghold in the North remained, and Severus would not turn aside from that objective. He proved the Protectorate's resolve to the Signarans who were he annihilated the blasphemous city of Fisherbrook before marching farther north. Felig was the first city selected for conquest, but once again the Cadoran and Signaran forces stood in the way of his holy cause, too locked in their century-long rivalry to recognize the divine purpose of Severus's followers. Although the Menites were unable to seize the city, they did succeed in destroying the monasteries of the Ascendant Angel Angelia, a, near, a nearby site devoted to one of Morrow's minions. Having achieved this blow to undermine the faith of those who had forsaken the Creator, Grand Scrutator Severus led his battered and diminished forces east in search of a more suitable site to establish a northern protectorate stronghold. His army made a long and harrowing trek to cross the Black River. There they were met with reinforcements that had crossed the Bloodstone Marches to rendezvous with them. Given the fresh infusion of war jacks and a large column of knight exemplars and temple flame guard, the crusade marched north into Lale. After battling through tenacious Cadoran border defenses, they discovered fresh allies among the Lale's resistance who had taken refuge in the occupied nation's eastern countryside. The resistance was badly in need of aid and reinforcements to halt the advance of the Cadorans who had seized the rest of Lale. They had also become embittered toward Signarn after watching the erstwhile allies retreat from the defenses of Lael. Severus proved to be able to be as able in diplomacy as in the battlefield as he crafted agreements with the ragtag freedom fighters, giving him the stepping stone that would eventually provide the means to create his northern stronghold. He had already chosen the ideal location, the northwestern Lely city of Laren. Larian has already served as the fulcrum for several notable events in the recent wars. Situated in the mountains, this extremely well-fortified and isolated city had been a major implement in the Cadoran planning for their invasion of the nation. The nearby town of Rivermet, Riversmet had been entirely annihilated solely to break the spirit of the city's defenders and provoke them and to open their gates to the Cadorans. The impressive nature of the battlements and the difficulties involved at besieging it, combined with the self-sufficiency, made it ideal for Northern Crusade's needs if they could seize it. Severus proved the strength of his own divine mandate in the days that followed. The Harbinger had prepared him for the difficulties that lay ahead by sending the Covenant of Meneth with him. The Holy Text was known to be capable at manifesting singular miracles and was part of a long-held prophecy. Severus understood the purpose and set forth to unlock the final seals to march to the battle against the Cadoran standing between his army and Laren. The bloodshed and strife of this conflict created necessary conditions to unleash the book's power in its full glory. The Grand Scrutator Severus, as its guiding hand, an imperishable reign of fire was unleashed to destroy the Cadoran army, but more importantly the invocation left a lingering holy aura on Severus. This heightened the Warcaster's already formidable persuasive powers, as if his every spoken word was informed by the mandate of the Creator. By the invocation of the miracles, and with intelligence provided by the resistance, Severus was able to see Laren without directly laying siege to its walls. He did so by confronting and converting two members of the ranking Greylord Tourney in charge with governance of the city for the Cadoran military. Severance convinced them their holy path to salvation required them to renounce their nation, rejoin the faith by putting aside their temporal allegiances, and open the gates to his army. After great trials and ordeals, the Northern Crusade had achieved its goals of finding the northern center of power, expanding the reach of the protectorates to new lands far from the old borders. Now it looks like we got a little side panel here. The first exemplar in interdictions, Laren, Northern Crusade, serving Grand Exemplar Michael Krios, or Michael. I'm probably going to call him Michael because uh, it's easier for me to pronounce on a regular basis. But let's read the army makeup and their little side notes here. The promotion of Michael Krios to Grand Exemplar brought new life and vigor to the Knights Exemplar's Brotherhood. And this is clearly demonstrated among the fighting men of the first Exemplar's interdiction. 
These soldiers would gladly lay down their lives for Krios, as he has fought and bled alongside them in countless battles. One common tale told among these knights is that the Grand Exemplar has not spent a single night in the Exemplar Fortress, their headquarters, since achieving his position. During the war, he has spent every day in battle alongside his brothers, and afterwards he loaned his strength to the reconstruction of Sol, helping clear rubble and set stones with his own hands until he was called north. The fact that both the Grand Exemplar and the Hierarch preferred to serve on the front lines rather than safely behind in its capital is a matter of pride to the first Exemplar interdiction, and they gladly endured the long march to join their brothers in arms among the Northern Crusade. The first Exemplar interdiction is a large force of hand-picked veteran knights. It includes a strong corps of foot soldiers supported by knight errants, alongside a small wing of Avenger cavalry and a small contingent of bastions and incinerators. Though composed solely of Exemplar knights, the first receives considerable support of fight alongside the other martial orders of the Northern Crusade. The force proved its mettle in the Caspia Soul War when they fought directly alongside Grand Exemplar Michael Krios for most of the major actions. All who fought in the defense of Seoul share a bond forged by a sight of their sacred city being brought to ruin and the miracle of its reclamation. Among the most famous battles in which this force fought was the first defense of the great temple of the Creator in Seoul shortly after the initial Signaran assault. Mustering the force of only a few hundred knights cut off from the rest of the city's brotherhood, Seneschal Plan Sarmoth cut into the flank of the Signaran attackers and battled through to rejoin the main defenders, including Krios, at the front of the Grand Temple. It was one of the hardest fought battles during the Siege of Seoul and represented a major turning point. These knights fought on despite being entirely surrounded by Stormblades and other Signaran forces. They were able to hold long enough for Fiora to arrive with similar ragtag assortment of Temple Flame Guard. The Signarans routed and were forced to withdraw to the western city. Many believe that if this temple had fallen, Seoul would have followed. The Grand Exemplar's duty leading the crusade often take him elsewhere, and in his absence the direct supervision and leadership of the first interdictions fall upon senior Sensul Tepelan Sarmoth, who reports to Krios directly. Sarmoth is greatly appreciated by the men as someone who has not who has shown not to only commitment to the cause, but also fidelity to his subordinates. He has felt the death of every soldier under his command, and after battle he regularly stands vigil to recite the lengthy litany for the dead of who have served under him. His memory for those names, a list now quite long, is seen as a sign that he takes no lives for granted, even as he knows sacrifices are needed in war. After the great casualties during the Southern Wars, the current members of the First Interdiction come from a wide variety of former interdictions and forces, each group the survivors of some great calamity. This desperate set of backgrounds serves to bring them closer together and allows them justification to claim they represent the entirety of their order. And of course, uh, we have leadership and assets makeup. Uh, leadership, of course, ran by Grand Exemplar Krios, followed by Sarmoth, followed by Marvent, followed by Hazan. Assets make up 600 Knights Exemplar, 400 Knights Exemplar Errants, 100 Knight Exemplar Avengers, 50 Knight Exemplar Bastions, 50 Knight Exemplar Senator, or Senators, Senators, that's how you, I imagine that's how you say it, and then 80 Heavy Warjacks and 10 Light Warjacks. But let's get back to the reading. Reclaiming Soul in the Invasion of Caspia As the Northern Crusade battled its way towards Lael, the majority of the protectorate military resources were tied up in southern conflicts. Tensions in the south reached a new peak on both protectorate and Signaran soil in the wake of the protectorate's declaration of independence. Signar took the unprecedented and extreme step to authorize Lord Commander Coleman Stryker to round up and imprison its own Mennonite citizenry in a large area between Corvus and Caspia. These Mennonites were arrested on the grounds that they might be secretly collaborating with the Protectorate, regardless of whether they were was any proof of collusion. The innocent Mennonites who put into prison barges and shipped down the Black River toward their eventual relocation on the Bloodshed Islands, a prison previously reserved for Signarn's most dangerous and hardened criminals. The holy city of Seoul became a vast staging ground 
for the largest Menite army assembled since the time of the priest king of old. Its ultimate goal was nothing less than the conquest of Caspia, Signar's imposing capital city, which sat across the river from Sol. With the greatest triumph at hand, however, the Menites' plans were thrown into chaos by the sudden Signarin attack that culminated in the full-scale invasion of Sol. For the first time in its history, Sol's formidable walls were breached and fighting spilled out into the sacred streets. This event immediately prompted the establishment of two major crusades, the Reclamation of Sol Crusade and the Crusade in Defense of the Great Temple. Both these forces devoted to the protection and reclamation of the city were tested to their limits, yet in time the faith and devotion were rewarded. The great temple of the creator and the sullen remembrance at the center of the city were kept safe from the interlopers and served as a rally to the city's defenders, who were eager to reclaim other sacred sites despoiled by the boots of unbelievers. The Signarns' lack of resolve of the faithful, and when their leader, Lord Stryker, was injured in battle with Fiora, protector of the flame, their will to fight crumbled. Swept up in the holy fervor and encouraged by the example of such great war leaders as Fiora and Grand Exemplar Krios, the Southern Crusade drove the Signarns out at last from the rubble-filled streets of Seoul. So hasty was their retreat that the enemy in and so closely did the Menites hound them at their heels that the Signarns could not seal the gates of Caspia in time. Menite forces overwhelmed the defenders at the bridge between the Sol and Caspia and seized the battlements, enabling them to keep the bridge open. The Menite soldiers stormed onto the streets of Caspia, and for the first time since the Signarn Civil War, Caspia and Sol were once a single city. And it has long been the dream of many living on both sides of the river to reunite the city of walls. Many Menite priests believe the entire city is a sacred relic of the priest king Gullivant, and the chance to bring this fallen city once again under the dominion of the Temple of Meneth was a chance Hyrak Voyle would not let pass. He personally led Ember's vast garrison from the capital to join the assault on Caspia. His arrival was fortuitous, despite his forces having claimed the outer gates the city of walls had proven to be extremely difficult to penetrate. The concentric defenses that had once thwarted even the Orgoth now stymied the invading Minites. Hyrak Voyle's arrival changed this as he shattered gateway after gateway by invoking the full potency and wrath of the Lawgiver. In the end, the capture of Caspio was not to be. Despite initial success, the Harbinger had foreseen and attempted to counsel Hyrak Voyle that an unrelenting advance would divide the faithful and threaten the integrity of the temple. Yet Hyark was too blind by the dream of uniting Caspia and the capturing of Castle Rainthorn to heed their warning and pressed on. This situation came to a head when Lord Commander Stryker stood in the way of the Minite advance and offered the terms for temporary truce. He showed his willingness to release thousands of imprisoned Minites who had been captured under his orders. The Harbinger advised Hyrak Voyle that accepting these terms would work the greater good of the temple, bringing yet more converts and weakening the will of Caspia's defenders against the proof of Minot's uh, miraculous interventions. Once again, Hyrak Voyle ignored her words, going so far as to order his followers to fire on the walls where the offered Minite prisoners had been positioned. In silent disapproval, the Harbinger martyred her own flesh to provide succor to the injured while High Paladin Darton Vilman of the Order of the Wall stepped forward to intervene for the helpless. The Hierarch demonstrated both his hubris and how completely his fixation on conquest had overcome his rationality. He misunderstood Vilman's stance as defiance and disobedience and struck him with what should have been a fatal blow. This act was too much for the Harbinger to allow as the Paladin had spent his life in good works in the name of Meneth and had repeatedly endangered his own life to defend the god's chosen voice. In the act of miraculous intervention, the Harbinger took the paladin's injury upon herself and suffered what should have been a mortal wound. Any hope that the shock of this might awaken Voile to his ill-chosen path was quashed when the Hierarch lashed out blindly against the Signaran enemy. Holding Lord Stryker to blame for the Harbinger's fall, in the ensuing fight, the sheltering hand of Meneth was pulled aside from the previously invincible Hyrak Voile, fell at last to his adversary, Lord Commander Stryker. The last moment of this battle are not well understood by the faithful, but some say it was the Harbinger's own infallible sword that ended Voile's life. 
No one can answer the question of whether the means of the Harbinger herself served as an instrument in the Hierarch's fall. Most prefer to avoid confronting this difficult theological question and its ramifications. Hierarch Voyle's body was returned to Seoul and then to Emmer, where he was buried with proper honor and dignity. Voyle will be remembered as visionary who launched the Great Crusade and who strengthened the protectorate of Minath. Severus swore to continue his work and that the Hierarch Ravenel before him, and by the Harbinger's revelation, he was chosen to be the next Hierarch. It was left to the Hierarch Severus to spread the Minite faith until all of mankind has learned to recognize the Creator properly or ex be extinguished for their heresy. As Sol was recovered and for the moment secure, the two Southern Crusades were ended, and with the understanding these faithful could be called again at the moment's notice. While the Southern territories consolidated their defensive garrisons, greater attention returned to the Northern Crusade where Hyrax Cerberus remained. Also, fun fact about the Harbinger of Minath, uh, she actually floats. Like, she doesn't touch the ground. Most of the time she has guys running around with chains keeping her from you know, ascending into the heavens to be with Mina directly. So, yeah, she's a pretty intimidating holy figure when she's floating around. So, fun character to see. Well, not fun if you're going up against her because, like, you know, that, that type of faith is pretty terrifying to go up against. But that's just a fun little side note. Moving on to Organization of Garrison and the Crusades. The Protectorate's active military forces are organized into garrisons and crusades. Garrisons include reinforcements, for the active forces and those reserved to defend protectorate territories and resources. The large garrisons are made up of, of a large number of temple flame guards supported by smaller number of soldiers from other orders. Although they can be allocated for offensive missions as needed, garrisons exist primarily to secure important cities and territories. Crusades are large groups of mixed forces brought together for specific long-term objectives. Generally, the most proactive of the Protectorate Armies, Crusades usually have goals that require the seizure of new territory or destruction of a specific target. Crusades with defensive goals are unusual but not unprecedented. As demonstrated during the invasion of Seoul by Signaran forces, the Crusade in defense of the Great Temple was such an action. But even in that case, the forces conducted missions against the nearest Signaran elements to preempt a counterattack. Crusades and garrisons are broken down into smaller functional groups called interdictions. These comprise smaller groups of forces called phalanxes, generally drawn from a singular military order, but they can be mixed as needed to achieve objectives. The hierarch appoints crusade leaders who in turn select interdiction leaders. By necessity, crusades are trusted only to senior warcasters, those who have the ability to control warjacks as well as lead troops on the battlefield. All members of the interdiction are subordinate to the commander regardless of their martial orders. At all levels of organization, priests in the temple hierarchy act as officers within the protectorate's armies. They command soldiers directly and organize logistic and supply. Experienced lay soldiers can be promoted to positions of authority such as army masters or preceptors. Individuals at these ranks frequently lead individual phalanxes, but they must treat priests with respect regardless of their position. In any situation where the chain of command is uncertain, priests are obeyed before secular commanders. A separate division of the priesthood leads the protectorate's larger zealot forces, which are considerably less organized and cohesive than the professional martial orders. These war priests are the most numerous and least influential clergy and rarely have any larger responsibilities beyond the ritual they conduct for the zealous local parishioners who had been gathered and armed for the war effort. The prayers of these war priests help ensure success and they offer last rites for the fallen. Above them are priests ranked potent or higher, or sorry, potentant, not potent. Potent is the uh, circle obra, sorry for that little fupa. Potent or higher. These war priests are chosen to march in battle in choir that empower sanctified war jacks in their holy prayers. Even though the higher ranking priests are often occupied with matters of governance, it is not unheard of them for them to enter a battle alongside the threatened garrison or to be chosen to lend their power to the active crusade. These truly formidable and pious emissaries of Minath 
often can wield singular potent prayers, and their example inspires soldiers to even greater heights of fervor and reinforce their strength and conviction in battle. Viscos Juvia Roven of Sol, for example, was heavily involved in the battles between Caspi and Sol, applying his power of prayer to both the Southern Crusades. Hierarch Voil joined in the battle personally during the invasion of Caspia and is credited for crushing the bulk of Caspia's defenses almost single-handedly. While the fact that the actions ended in his death underscores the risk, Rovin's example stirred the protectorate martial orders to a greatest united effort. Hierarch Severus has similarly shown no sign of leaving his active post within the Northern Crusade to return to the safety of Emmer. The Protectorate's military underwent significant organizational changes following the Caspia Soul War. Hierarch Severus remained in Laren to lead the Northern Crusade, so a large number of soldiers were sent to support his efforts. This is the only currently active crusade. Those devoted to the reclamation of Soul have been officially disbanded, and the bulk of their forces returned to the defense of the Sacred City and the Protectorate borders. Southern forces remain at their highest alert, ready to battle the enemy across the Black River, but the fighting in the south has calmed considerably and now occurs primarily in smaller engagements north of the walled cities. Operations in this quarter has taken on a more subversive and clandestine nature as each side seeks to undermine the other without provoking full retaliation. The uneasy truce between the two nations continued undefined and Caspian and Sol remained officially at war. Accordingly, the great number of the Protectorate's battle-ready warcasters have been reassigned to the Northern Crusade. These transfers include the Harbinger of Meneth alongside the Testament, the Grand Exemplar Krios, who took with him a sizable contingent of hand-picked Exemplar Knights, and the day-to-day -day oversight of the Northern Crusade has been left to the Grand Exemplar, who reports directly to Hierarch Severus on all matters. The massive garrison stationed in Laren is commanded by Vice Scrutator Vindicus who, like Severus, is blessed with the rare warcaster talent. The garrison supplies troops and materials aid to the Northern Crusade throughout the ongoing battles. High ex Executioner Resnick has been given command of the auxiliary forces and answers only to Severus. Some believe this arrangement reflects his rift between Severus and Grand Exemplar Krios, but others take it as a sign that the Hierarch wisely uses different tools for different ends. While no one can command the High Executioner except for the Hierarch, Resnick has limited personal authority and commands only those men and women directly selected for his interdiction. With so much of the Protectorate's military focused on the North, the absence of Fiora, the Protector of the Flame, is notable and has been widely interpreted among senior priests and martial officers as a sign of her disfavor with the Hierarch. In fact, Fiora's authority has become greater than even before as she has been left with the general oversight of all southern garrisons. These include the garrisons of Sol, Emmer, Ichthyr, and the Tower of Judgment. The top-level oversight of each of these regions is entrusted to Viscos and Scrutators, but the garrison's commander officer, commanding officers are Fiora's loyal subordinates. Fiora is further established as a protocol whereby members of the Flame Guard Incendium serve as intermediary intermediaries between top-ranking priests and leading garrison officers. These measures were undertaken in the name of the military efficiency and expediency, but also allow Fiora to control the flow of information and resources allocation to the bulk of the southern military. These garrisons represent a sizable force that could be allocated to a new crusade should the need arise, but at the same time the Protectorate must defend its borders and cities. Certainly, the protection of the, both Sol and Emmer in particular is absolutely vital, especially with the home territory left potentially vulnerable after so many military assets have been moved to the Northern Crusade. The Viscos, in particular, are uneasy with the arrangement and have counseled Severus to return south along with some portion of his armies to ensure the safety of the nation's interior. Thus far, Hierarch has ignored all such advice. The Hierarch occupied the Northern Crusade, Fiora has taken to attending Synod's meetings and now serves as Severus's unofficial proxy on military matters. This has given her a taste of the Hierarch's responsibility, which she has embraced enthusiastically. 
There is no question that Fiora, the protector of the flame, is presently the most influential and powerful military figure in the Southern Protectorate. In many respects, she has held above the individual Viscos, several of whom periodically solicit her opinions. The Southern Scrutator, including five of the nine Viscos, serve as Severus's eyes and ears in the South and watch Fiora closely. As yet, her actions seem to be in good faith. She has not shown signs of ambition beyond her station. Her influence over the remaining Viscos, however, is observed with growing concern. Whew, and that does it for the old archives, which, yeah, that is a lot of reading, but you did hear the rise and fall of Voil, so that's always fun to see. I always thought he was stabbed by Commander Stryker, but hearing that, I always thought that was a rumor that he was taken down by the Harbinger. But that is where they stand, or at least they stood then. Let's see if we have any updates in the newer archives, so let's let's go over it. Well, after reading through a lot of the old lore, <laughs> it appears that not much has changed in regards to their history. They have been at a standstill. I imagine... Uh, when they finished the old archives, the well, the new archives were actually just coming out. So I suppose they didn't really add too much. Actually, I would say there was actually less information on the new archives because I imagine they'd probably be like, oh, well, look at the old archives. But we are given actually more extensive stuff on their forces. So we will read each one of these sections right now. Temple Flame Guard. Once solely charged with protecting temples and holy places, the Flame Guard have been transformed over the last generation into standing professional army of the Protectorate of Minoth. With shield and smoldering spear in hand, they march in battle with unprecedented numbers, forming the core of the theocracy garrisons, as well as the bolstering its crusade, crusading armies. Commanding absolute loyalty to her soldiers, Fiora, the priestess of flame and head of the Incendium, the priestly order charged with the administration and spiritual needs of the Flame Guard. The capital of Emmer hosts the Incendium central headquarters, but the order's priests operate throughout the command structure of the Flame Guard. Members of the Temple Flame Guard begin as no novitiates and devote six months to initial training during which they rigorously drill the use of their armor and weapons and receive training to maneuver and maneuvers and formations. Afterward, they are initiated into the Flame Guard and are assigned to a garrison or crusading forces. A veteran Flame Guard may be promoted to the Arms Master or given command of his own unit. A veteran Arms Master may in turn be promoted to a Preceptor yeah, I said that right, and given charge of a detachment and scorer of spearmen. Secular officers seldom see promotions beyond the rank of Preceptor. Next come captains, who each command a phalanx composed of up to a hundred soldiers. Commanders oversee large garrisons of multiple phalanxes with thousands of flame guards and answer directly to the Priestess of the Flame. The Order has several branches whose members serve distinct roles. Flame Guard Cleansers are a disciplinary force of arms, and the Flame Guard safeguards and purity both within and beyond the Protectorate's boundaries. Led by Malachus, the Burning Truth, and wielding flame-spewing purifiers, the cleansers sanctify the heretical with gouts of purifying flame. The Daughters of the Flame are an elite and incredibly specialized group drawn from the widows, daughters, and mothers and sisters of the fallen Minite soldiers and were originally charged with the covert security of Minite holy places. Over time, Fiora has begun to call upon the daughters to eliminate threats of the protectorate both internal and external. The Daughters are organized into small strike forces called Hands, each led by a veteran captain. Though the Daughters employ a number of solo operations, they lack an additional structure. The Order is commanded by Thyra, Flame of Sorrow, who answers directly into Fiora. Incendium Priests serve as the highest ranking officers of the Flame Guard. They hold ranks identical to other priests, but are not eligible to become Scrutators. Some of the Hierarch's agents believe that members of the Incendium have become more loyal to Fiora than to him, but they have not yet acted against these individuals. We have the Knight's Exemplar. Devoted to carrying out the will of the Scrutators, the Knight's Exemplar first came to prominence during the Thousand Cities era. 
The order defined by its code of absolute obedience now comprises the, as the preeminent warrior of the Soul Minite Temple. Those who, whether intensive training, dedicate themselves to serve as Minites' living weapons on Cain. Their sacred oaths absolve them of any harm inflicted in the pursuance of their orders, which allows them to serve the scrutator of the Protectorate without question. Newly invested exemplar knights are honored and with blessed weapons such as ancient relic blades and sacred armor that has been passed down through the generations. Putting aside considerations of their past, including any family ties, the Brotherhood is bounded by a strongest of bonds. For knights, the order becomes his true family. The majority of the exemplar knights are trained to fight on foot, focusing on expertise with the blade. The order is quite large, however, and has several small disciplines within distinct roles, like the heavy, heavily armored bastions, the errants, who serve as the order's far-reaching advanced strike force, and the vengers, who serve as the protectorate's heavy cavalry. Exemplar knights begin the initiates and undergo many years of harsh training to become full knights. Veteran knights may be promoted to sergeants or charged with leading small detachments. And most accomplished and fanatical sergeants rise to the rank first to become wardens who lead phalanxes, then sentinels, and ultimately high exemplars, the high rank entrusted to the command large numbers of knights, including full interdictions. The leader of the entire order is the Grand Exemplar. Though Michael Krios was promoted to intercessor, he has also holds the title of Grand Exemplar, and these roles and duties are considered con cumulative and distinctive. As Grand Exemplar, Krios oversees a knightly order, and the intercessors, he speaks with the authority of Hierarch and can overrule leaders of other martial orders. And then we move on to the Order of the Fist. The Order of the Fist is a group of monastic warriors who undergo a strenuous and extensive aesthetic regime meant to refine their bodies and minds. They seek to internalize the message of the true law and to become an empty vessel for the will of Minas. Over the course of their training, they learn to perform seemingly miraculous feats of strength and physical control. Although deadly with their bare hands and feet, some allegiance of this order employ weapons in battle as well. Since it began, the Order of the Fist has served to maintain the order within the population of the Protectorate. With their emphasis on unarmed fighting and requiring no special armor or vestments, allegiance easily blend in with the general population. In this way, they serve as an unobtrusive secret police force in towns and cities and complement the efforts of the scrutators in rooting out heresy and sedition. Allegiance study the strength of stone and the fluidity of sand until the application of deadly force becomes as natural to them as breathing. Though belonging to a relatively new order, allegiance consider their fighting style to be an evolution of ancient teachings gleaned from the first city of antiquity, drawing inspiration from some of the most ancient passages inscribed into the wall of the ancient Ichthyr. They learn their techniques at the order's secluded monasteries in the Vardhan province. Members begin as initiates and generally endure a decade of training and immersion in the order's philosophies before being recognized in the allegiant. These have become particularly skilled, may eventually become senior allegiance and high allegiance. The leader of the order, Grand High Allegiant Harvan Graydon, has held his post since the order's inception and has worked with Garrick Voyle, the former hierarch, to creating the martial arts used by all allegiance. Now we move on to the Order of the Wall. The Order of the Wall is the oldest but smallest midnight knighthood, an organization dedicated to the preservance, preservance of faithful from the perils found outside of civilization. Its philosophies and fighting style are thought to embody one of the most vital of Minot's earliest gifts, the wall itself, which stood between the light and the darkness. While battling enemies of faith, the Order of the Wall stands alongside the other martial orders, but the paladins prefer to defend the faithful rather than marching to war. However, the order recognizes the protection sometimes requires the fire of faith to be wielded against those who embody destruction and chaos. Most paladins believe the order's origins can be traced to the Valant of Thrace, the priest king who founded Galassia in 2800 BR. Though Valant's great wall had long since fallen to ruin, Caspian's soul endure, 
and the orders consider these cities to be their most sacred places, and the walls themselves to be the relics of the faith. Paladins of the Order have long been heroes to the common people, seen as embodying the protective aspects of Meneth, sometimes neglected by clergy. Indeed, the Order has endured a difficult relationship with the priesthood and the protectorate because it is one of the few martial groups that answers to the code not rooted in obedience to the priest caste. The Scrutator's caste came to view the Knight's Exemplar as a more useful tool, causing the Order of the Wall to suffer a long decline. Relatively, few young protectorate warriors can temper their rage with mercy required of those who would wield the Order's blessed firebrand blades. Paladins prioritize forbearance and protection of the innocent. They can put them at odds with the Scrutators, but so long as they do not openly interfere with or defy the Hierarch or his agents, they are left to their ancient code. The Order experienced a recent revival in popularity and widespread support after Signar invaded Sol in 606 AR, and the efforts made by the Harbinger have ensured that they are likely always have a place even in small numbers. The Order has a limited rank structure. An exceptional knight may be recognized as a high paladin serving as a senior officer of the Order. The Master of the Order is a Grand Paladin who oversees the members of Sol and the current Grand Paladin is Triton Borador, and as mentioned earlier, the Auxiliary Militia and Levies. In addition to the Martial Orders, nearly a third of the Protectorate population is capable of being armed on short notice and stands ready to fight as members of the Auxiliary Militia and Levied Zealots. In most cases, they are trained in the use of simple weapons such as staves, maces, and short swords. And most disciplined and well-trained of the militias are the Deliverers, who drill in the use of their rockets, and are prepared to stand in support of regular soldiers like the Temple Flame Guard. Zealot's mobs are drawn from the most fanatical citizens and are led by priests who inspire and, and command them in battle. Joining the Auxiliary are a band of Idrians, tribal groups dwelling throughout the Bloodstone Deserts. Many Idrians were converted to the worship of Meneth during the reign of Hierarch Luktine. Under the Hierarch's guidance, the Protectorate brought the fires of conversion into the parched deserts, taking in all who would accept the word of the Lawbringer, and putting many others to the torch. While not every Idrian is a devout worshipper of the Creator of Man, many have given up their former heretical beliefs and have embraced the Sol Menite religion. Many practiced a slightly modified variant of the faith, a deviation the Scrutators actively discourage, but have never managed to eradicate. Idrians often fight alongside the Solis brethren as irregulars or scouts, leading to the war bands of Rus, the foremost warriors of their tribes. For the citizens of the Protectorate, service in a time of crusade is compulsory, and the clergy are issued quotas for able-bodied men and women required to fill the ranks of the auxiliary fighting forces. Initiates of the Order of the Fist have proven adept at rounding up and enlisting those who had not demonstrated the devotion or piety expected of a citizen. Nonetheless, the continual immersion of the populace in religious doctrines make it easy to gather large numbers of willing zealots and soldiers of all ages to press them into service. And that is all we got for Meneth, or for the Protectorate of Meneth. Thank you guys so much for sticking around if you have. Um, that is a lot. I know we have a lot of information there, but we did read two different sections for this compared to when we were working on Kodor and the Circle Obros, but I do appreciate it. And if you guys enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know what you like. Let me know if there's anything in the Protectorate that you, you know, like, that you hate, that you don't know if it'll work. <laughs> Honestly, I always thought the Temple Flame Guard looked kind of cool myself, but uh, that's what it is. But uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you again, Private Your Press, for letting us read your fantastic lore. And as always, class dismissed.